Here are my top five problems with Suicide Squad and some possible solutions. Number five, the plot. There are so many problems with the plot, but this is the most obvious. Why did Amanda Waller do anything? Why did she want to start up the Suicide Squad? Did she want money, power? Did she want to manipulate and hurt people? What was the point of the story here? Apparently it was of fears of having the next Superman. Quote, in a world of flying men and monsters, this is the only way to protect ours. So how exactly is using convicts, two of which have supernatural powers, one of which who isn't a convict and has a magical sword, going to be able to stop a Superman level threat? Why are we taking this weird drastic measure? How is this going to be effective? Is having bombs in convex necks going to make them perform better doing something? Can these people even stop or hurt Superman? Does, does Waller know this? We know that magic can hurt Superman, but fire can't. And why isn't Superman in this story, yet Batman is in flashbacks? Wouldn't it have made more sense to study these people and learn how to manipulate or control, if not replicate their powers, as opposed to just making a team of convicts and threatening them with death? The comic book versions do this with Task Force X in a much more believable manner, but that's the comic book, not a movie. We learn about this desire to make a team in the intro, and at that point in the story, Waller just wants to make a team. There's no reason to, aside from there being some potential threat. So the Enchantress just decides to escape, because she's a wizard, finds a relic of hers somewhere in some underground building she teleported to, and this relic is her trapped wizard brother, and she decides to free him. And this instigates the need for a suicide squad to stop a supernatural metahuman whatever threat. It comes out of nowhere, which leads to our next problem. Number four, characters and genre. Why are there so many characters? An ensemble cast needs to have individual function. This ties in with the heist subgenre, examples being Inception, The Dirty Dozen, or The Oceans Trilogy. Everyone needs to bring something to the story, mechanically and dramatically. First, for the plot to function, then for it to resonate, to mean something to us. If a story isn't logical and dramatic, it's a waste of time. Mechanics are what make a story logical. For example, if El Diablo is needed to melt down some sort of ice barrier that no one else can circumvent. Drama is what makes an effective emotional story, which was attempted with the flashbacks, I think. But because there's no central character or protagonist, no real flaws that were challenged from these people, no real growth can occur, and the goal or plots of the characters are thus broken or flattened down. This is a very complicated form of storytelling because you have so many plots trying to work together, and if they don't mesh well or don't even exist, then you got a giant mess, or a big series of empty action scenes, which is pretty much what Suicide, suicide Squad is. Firstly, everyone is useless at the start because we have no idea what they're trying to do, how they're going to do it, why, or what exactly they're up against. We don't know the scope of the threat, except we're definitely not ready to fight someone like General Zod. When Flag complains about getting a team of professional soldiers or marines, yeah, that's that's good, he's right. Send, in the, send the marines in for these kinds of operations. Send some scouts, figure it out. Stupidly enough, they send such marines with the Suicide Squad, so... What's the point of sending both? Are they going to perform better under duress or with each other? Or are the Suicide Squad cannon fodder or are the Marines cannon fodder? Once we get underway, we still find Slipknot, Captain Boomerang, and Katana are completely useless to the plot. There's no reason for them to be here. I thought that Katana, having a soul-sucking sword, could seal the Enchantress if the undead witch couldn't be killed. But apparently that wasn't even a consideration. Amanda Waller instigates the whole thing because she's scared of Superman even though he never appears in the film. Enchantress causes all this mess because she randomly found her brother and then she steals her heart back and does an over-the-top Gozer impression. Rick Flagg is in control of the lethal leech the squad is on and has emotional attachment to the host of the secondary antagonist. He's Waller's puppet and he's good at lobbing bombs into supernatural portals. Slipknot exists only to drive home the stakes that the Suicide Squad are on the lethal leash, but we already knew that. Yes, he is the KG beast from Assault on Arkham. Killer Croc is apparently the only one who can go into a submerged basement of a building to move or turn a bomb on or something, and El Diablo is able to maneuver the mini-boss into that position. Harley Quinn exists to pick up Katana's sword and use it to slice him in Enchantress's chest to pull out her heart. Deadshot is good at shooting a bomb that Rick Flag can throw when near the supernatural portal thing. That's it. Dramatically, nothing really worked because there was no character development. 
El Diablo is kind of broken, but not broken enough for him to make any great character strides. All he does is go from kind of broken to getting angry and using his powers to fight his opposition. That's not real character growth. He's just getting taunted by Deadshot and just starts fighting the wizard brother in Ignis mode. Who knew he could even do that or what was going to happen? No one cares about Harley Quinn and her psycho love or whatever Joker wants. Deadshot is whining about his daughter. Katana crying about her husband or whatever. Captain Useless being a jerk. Killer Croc being a monster. None of this matters. None of their conflicts calls them to make any decision that caused them to change psychologically or morally. They're the same characters throughout. There is one character that is faced with a distinctive choice, and that is Rick Flagg, where he chooses duty over love and is rewarded with both at the end. But it didn't have much weight. We see Amanda Waller hack Enchantress's heart with an ice pick throughout the story, so he knows full well what he's gotten himself into and what kind of scenario his feelings for June have been in all this time. The Enchantress saying, you don't have the balls, takes Rick a whole six seconds to make the decision to stop her heart. Immediately afterward, Flag is a bit unhappy, walks back, so there's really no noticeable character change here. Number three, structure and pacing. It takes a whole 20 to 30 minutes to introduce the characters, have Amanda Waller explain her plan and reintroduce the characters, then Waller explain her plan again to some boardroom, and then five minutes for the Enchantress to start teleporting, and then another 10 to 15 minutes to get everyone together and see what the plot is. It's 45 minutes in just to get the ball rolling. It's horrible pacing. Number two, the villain or villains. The main villain is Amanda Waller, and she's perhaps the worst version of herself I've seen. The secondary villain is the Enchantress, and she's an over-the-top gozer. And the sub-boss is the Enchantress's brother. And for some reason, the Joker is here. While he has a dramatic reason to interfere with the main plot, the story would have been just fine without him and Harley Quinn. Never mind his characterization is insane to the point of being completely incomprehensible. Is he a gangster? Is he just nuts? Does he really love Harley? I don't quite buy or understand any of it. What should have happened is a subplot. Now, a subplot is where a side character or supporting cast member has a side story that runs parallel to the main plot and then connects with it usually at the end. Joker could have been a mob boss who didn't like his territory being taken over by the main villain. Or he wanted to be the main cause of chaos in his territory instead of someone else. He also wanted to get Harley back and could have challenged the authority of the main protagonist, Rick Flagg, by compromising everyone's neck bomb as we saw he helped Harley out when she escaped with that scientist guy. Hey, join me now. I'll free you all and you'll help me stop that big scary thing in that building in the process. What would have been a higher level technique was to mirror the three male-female relationships and showcase a common theme of love between them. June and Rick, Harley and the Joker, and the Enchantress and her brother. All three groups would do anything for the other. This would showcase their personal morals amidst their public ethical or unethical behavior. Who wins out in the end and why? This would demonstrate someone as useless as Harley Quinn in combating the main opponent can overcome her simple humanity and be as cunning and relentless as she is to be with the man she loves despite her simple human frailties when up against powerful magical beings. Another comparison that would make the Joker relevant would be the theme of power, that is comparing himself and Waller. Whereas Joker is the crown prince of crime, Waller is the queen of corruption within the government. Both are evil in their own respects, both command authority, and both would be after the same thing, stopping the big bad, but for various reasons. This comparison is unfortunately never made. And number one, the premise. Yep, the story fails at the premise. If Amanda Waller knew this was going to happen, and that the Enchantress would seek out her brother and start up her own army by constructing them out of the people of the city, then the premise of the Suicide Squad would make sense. It would work. You just have to throw in hints of her wanting power, giving the Enchantress the opportunity to discover her brother, and you have the workings of a worthy Batman supervillain. Unfortunately, that isn't the case here. Now, if she did know or set this up, she'd be a mastermind, and that's a good thing. Considering Batman is also a mastermind, that would make her comparison to the Joker equal. It would explain a lot, like her entire behavior and the entire story. We didn't have to learn a smidgen of her plot to at least know something about why she's doing all this, but that never happens. She's just a cruel, evil, evil person with no intelligence. The last scene with Bruce Wayne could have been a wonderful semi-reveal moment, like at the end of The Usual Suspects, where Kaiser Soze is revealed. Waller could 
reveal she knew what was going to happen, with a little bit of knowledge of who Bruce Wayne is and what the Justice League is, because she's scared of Superman, and thus her real target is them. This was just a trial run to see how she can compare against the real threat. Bruce Wayne, with his brilliant mind, as he starts walking away, begins to put the pieces together of what just happened in Midway City, who was involved, and that Waller is playing the verbal card, even if it is just a theory in his head at the time. But that was just my take on the Suicide Squad fiasco. Feel free to leave your ideas in the comments section.